Hello and welcome to Tyrannus Gaming. Today I want to share my thoughts and then show you the video in the title, so I'll keep this brief. I saw a few YouTube videos titled Star Citizen Genesis and New Star Citizen Engine, but these videos were not something I appreciated watching as they give the false impression that the Star Engine is somehow equivalent to Starfield's Creation Engine. The Creation Engine and CryEngine both have developed over 22 years, with Starfield and Star Citizen being the end results. Starfield required 8 years in development and requires years more in patches and mods to iron out its shortcomings. But, you know, hey, at least you got a completed game no matter how bad it is, right? Star Citizen released 11 years ago and what you're about to see is an update to the engine, which will be released to all owners of Star Citizen for free rather than through a $10 fee. Thanks to all those space whales that puffed up the $700 million that SIG is sitting on. This video is dedicated to you, Star Whales, from a poor Star Citizen. Without you, Star Citizen wouldn't be possible. Enjoy the presentation. Leverage to place flora and fauna, yes, but also settlements, buildings, alien and human life in a planetary context. This creates worlds that are scientifically plausible, richer in gameplay opportunities. We want you to find adventure just by going around the planets without a quantum point. We want you to find actions along your path. For this, we are changing how we made the game. We are scaling how we made the game in all areas. This is not just a planet tech update. This is a collection of systems that we call Genesis. Now, to help me explain all this nice work and this nice technology, let us kick us off and I welcome our very own Ali Brown and Will Hine for phase one of Genesis. Hello, Star Citizen. Yes, hello, Citizen Con. Yeah. So let's start with some introductions. This guy over here is Will Hain, aka Water Guy or River Guy. And this lovely gentleman is Ali Brown, pusher of pixels extraordinaire. And we're here to tell you about phase one of Genesis, which we're entitling The Laws of Nature. And this revolves, revolves around the fundamental approach we use to build our planet and is the literal foundation for everything else we're going to talk about in this talk today. Now, it centers on data-driven, physically-based rules that we aim to realistically emulate nature and its incredible diversity. Before we dive in a bit deeper, let's just recap on some of the things we already have on our planets. So here you can see our lovely atmosphere and our cloud rendering, which can provide some spectacular views. We have our on-the-fly terrain generation, which is no loading screens in our game, which we're very proud of. And then we have our scattering system that can populate these planets with many different diverse biomes. And we've been setting quality benchmarks for each of these biomes as we come across them one by one. But what we have isn't perfect. This scene on Microtech, it looks great, but it's not getting the same density that you'd expect from a real pine forest. That's one of the things we want to solve. The other, if I take you to the other side of Microtech, you'd be excused if you thought we'd just turned around and looked at a different part of the forest. Why is that? Well, this is because currently our artists create slices of biomes in great number, and then they distribute them across the planet using humidity and temperature properties. Each slice looks great in isolation, as you've seen, as you've explored. But this is not the solution to give us varied and natural biomes across an entire planet. Additionally, just using humidity and temperature limits us to only two degrees of variation. And that's not enough for the sorts of planets and worlds that we want to create and for you to explore. So how are we going to scale up our planet generation? Well, as I said before, we're going to start with physically-based rules that drive everything. We want nothing to feel random on these planets. We want no limitations on the number of biomes. We want infinite biomes that are continuously changing across the planets. And we want extreme density, and we want to maintain or exceed all of the quality levels we've set with our existing biomes. And most importantly, we want it to be scalable so that we can really scale up to the level of content that the designers are expecting. And from your perspective, we want you to be able to truly explore and find unique playing opportunities everywhere on our planets. So to start this, we're going to need more data. So 
If we see here some of our existing data sets on our planets, we have temperature, which we define locally and globally, and humidity, and that's it for now. With Genesis, we add many other data sets, such as the geology type, the soil type, and then we also go for things like the soil depth and the quality and the nutrients, and many other properties all drive this complex data set that we use to build rule sets on that each individual asset can describe how it should work with them. We're going to put something together and show you some demos today using some of the assets that you've already know and love in the PU. Although you might see some new stuff later, we'll save that. What you're going to see is a vertical slice of development. It's very early stages, very work in progress. You might see some bugs, but that means it's only going to get better, so be excited. The number one challenge with planets in our game is scale. In no other context do you need a planet to look great from first person perspective when you're stood among the trees. You need it to look great when you're in a spaceship at a quantum marker miles away and everywhere in between. There are no loading screens, you see everything. We cannot afford for it to look bad in any of those scenarios. So let's start from a ground perspective. Demo number one, let's have a look. So, how do we make that? Thank you, thank you. So, let's talk about first what's underneath it all. The ground! So, <laughs> so, in our previous terrain shader, we just switched between different ground textures depending on climate and didn't really consider the unique properties of each type. Now, the terrain shader is based around four layers. We always first consider bedrock at the bottom of it all. Then, where appropriate, we add layers of soil of different types. We then add debris where appropriate, whether it be pine needles, dead leaves, etc. And then, when it gets cold, we add snow. Each of these layers has unique shading properties and unique transitions between them. Because we do this all in one shader, we're able to achieve that as well as being performant. We can also use things like water saturation to darken and tint the soil and other properties to make it look more realistic. But that's not what filled most of the screen in that demo. That's the vegetation. Like what Ali said, we want to emulate the laws of nature. So in Genesis, we have rule sets for every asset that tells it how to respond to our rich data, whether it be soil type, water availability, temperature, geology, or whatever. We assess the viability and the vitality of each asset and compare them to decide what is likely to spawn in a natural environment. This automatically creates the cohesive environments that you saw in that clip. Not handcrafted anymore. No one has told those ferns and those pines to be like that. They each want to be like that. And that's what we're doing, multiple assets coming together to create a unique microbiome. What about trees then? Same thing. They have a larger requirement for space. They have a larger requirement for nutrients. That's how you see the distribution, and it's how it all works. Let's meet the flora that came together to beat that forest, to beat that forest, to make that forest, and have a look at some of their properties. Now, just to note, they are all going to look quite similar, because we've already seen them in the same place, so they must be similar. So building blocks, like grass, and common grass, medium amounts of sunlight. We had ferns, see it's a much lower requirement for sunlight. We had salix bushes forming our undergrowth. And we had pines, of course, and multiple variations of pines. Diversity is driven by competition. Everything has ideal conditions, which affects its competitiveness. We also have additional control over this in the form of dominance, which allows us to make one asset more competitive and more dominant than another, which is just what we see in nature. Everything is constantly fighting for resources and, of course, light. Because we spawn these assets in a hierarchy, it's easy to propagate shade data down over the distribution of the assets so that we can control ones that prefer or reject shade. Often, like these ferns, they can spawn in light, but they are outcompeted in those scenarios most of the time. 
So you will see a rogue fern or a place where there's no seeds for a specific asset, you might start to get this coming in. Let's take a look from a larger perspective again. So to take you through some of the things we saw in that clip, let's talk about rocks first. So anyone that's done a lot of ground driving and ground vehicles might have seen that our rocks sometimes feel a little bit randomly scattered and can be quite an obstacle sometimes. So in this clip, you saw that the, the rocks are no longer randomly scattered and they're now bla placed based on physically based rule sets. And this logical grouping is, is achieved via erosion simulations, which we run offline to build localized data maps. And they describe the size of the aggregate and rocks and the density and where they should naturally form. And that means we get things like these natural clusters of boulders at the forest edge underneath the cliffside. And on that note, you might have noticed that the cliffs have been dramatically improved in how they shade. We also get to see things like the natural clumping of vegetation caused by seed dispersal. This is controlled per species, so we can get better emulation of their unique growth patterns and create a much more realistic environment. And we also calculate the slope aspect, which is the exposure to vegetation to solar radiation and other environmental factors. And this allows us different species to flourish in different conditions, as we can see on different sides of this valley. Then over larger scale, we calculate the age and vitality of each tree individually to drive exactly how high they should be, but also the color of their leaves. Now, this isn't the only thing that will drive the color of the leaves. We're going to introduce the concept of seasons to the game. And this will mean our planets will evolve through the year, and we'll be able to shed leaves from trees and have the grass wither in winter. So as you're starting to see, all these rules, all this data, it's all coming together to create what we call truly emergent biomes. Let's have one more look at how this varies over a much larger scale. Just like in real life, oh, thank you. Just like in real life, our areas should vary, even by traveling a few kilometers. If you get in a helicopter and fly over the Alps, it all looks a bit snowy, but when you look closer, it's constantly changing. And we're now able to accurately represent that 
with our changing data. Another very important factor to mention is the distant look. In this screenshot, you don't see a single tree, and yet the, tree, the terrain is still green. We previously did that with artist-made lookup tables that told the planet what color to be at what position. But that wasn't going to work with all our new data and our far more complex spawning. Now we have a systemic solution. The planet shader is able to intelligently evaluate what's going to spawn there using the same rule sets that cause the assets to spawn there when you get there. That means we can sample the sort of color that that is going to project onto the orbital view and use it. We get a far better accuracy from the result. Together, by creating rules and authoring data that works, we create a continuously varying planet that sets the scene for the incredible exploration gameplay I know you guys are going to have. But how have we done this without compromising on performance? So yeah, with all these new data sets and these physically based spawning rules, you're probably wondering, how is this going to handle in your CPU? We don't want to melt anyone's CPU. So we've redesigned all of this tech to work much more efficiently than before. And now it can run on many cores. This allows it to be run perfectly well on both the CPU and the GPU. So we've redesigned our framework so that we can run it at both and swap between them freely. Now, the benefit of this is we can do things like, first off, move the terrain system to the GPU. And we've now done that to get some incredible performance improvements. But we then also cache the results in something we call a virtual terrain texture. I'll give you a quick demo of this now. This is now vastly faster than the previous system, but it also allows us to generate the terrain in much higher resolution, which means all the popping you can see on the mountains as we're approaching, all of that should be completely eliminated on the right-hand side of the screen. With the extra headroom we've gained by making our terrain system more efficient, we've been able to introduce some improvements, including high resolution ground textures, proper blending between surface types, and of course, better tiling. If you're familiar with any of our planets, we've taken off all the assets so you can see the issue. And now how it looks, you don't see those lines going at all. <laughs> and one more. With the terrain data cached on the GPU, like Ali said, we can perform the scattering there too, which is significantly faster. All those algorithms that we've used to generate those first bits can run there without being more expensive on your CPU. And it also means the results are directly there on the GPU. We can render straight from them. That allows us to have dramatically more density in our new system. We can render objects directly without having to go via the CPU every frame. We also cull at different levels of granularity with bigger groups in the distance and individual assets up close. Just as a demonstration, this is the sort of density you can expect on Microtech today. And in a second, we'll flip over to what you can expect from the new upcoming tech. In a second, we're going to turn on the culling groups, Devo, so you can see. These are the groups that we create of those trees and of the terrain. And as we get closer, we shrink them so we're more intelligently rendering what we need without having to assess each tree individually, all the way down to the ground. So to recap some of the things you've seen here in phase one, we had data-driven rules based on physically-based data, generating emergent biomes that continuously vary across our planets to get infinite possibilities. And we've achieved this with much greater density than before and much faster rendering. And we also achieved seamless transitions from ground to space with zero popping. So now that we've got all this tech, it's time to talk about how art might make use of this. So for that, I'll hand you to the next phase towards Sebastian Schroeder. Thank you, guys. Thank you. No Thank you. Wow. Thank God it's only 20 of you. Otherwise, I'd be nervous. <laughs> right. Thanks for having me. I'm here on behalf of the Planet Content team. And we're very excited to finally show you some of the things we've been working on. Um, as you've just seen from Will and Ali, the system keeps growing both complexity and capability, so our libraries have to grow alongside it. Wait, should I click? 
No. Um, no, I should click. Yeah, click. Oh, there we go. So, our goal of the content is to provide our goal is to provide the content that the system needs to populate every corner of every planet with realistic environments. And this content is what this phase of Genesis is all about, emergent biomes. For our first example of today, it's almost a shame Will left because like, it's about moisture, but let's look at very high moisture and medium to high temperature. Thanks, that did look really good. So, for swamps, we obviously made vegetation that feels at home in or near water. But before we dive in, allow me to give you a quick primer on our approach to authoring plants. Most species can survive in a fairly wide range of climate conditions, but will only thrive if the conditions are ideal. To support this concept, we author our vegetation assets to describe the full growth cycle of a species. If the conditions aren't ideal, they may not grow at the full maturity or look their best, but the species can still exist. So, let's have a closer look. For the water's edge, we made plants like this Alternatera and the iris. We also need the aquatic ones to float on the water surface, like the water lily or the pickerel weed. This willow and the one after, a Chinese tallow tree, while comfortable near water, we can also use to replace some of the more aged assets used to seeing elsewhere in the game. The last one, it's, it's taking a bit longer now, but um, the last one, I'm gonna wait. The last one you may not see used much in other biomes, but it's a very iconic one for the swamp, the bald cypress. So another feature we need for make a swamp experience a proper one is water interaction. Over the last year or two, a lot of work has gone into improving the way our water reacts and renders. So naturally, we wanted to make a biome that highlights those advances. Let's have a brief look at what it's like being inside the swamp. As you walk through or swim through the water, you may come across obstacles like logs or debris floating on the surface. They will react to the player character and can be pushed out of the way. We were also pleasantly surprised when we first saw how the water simulation systemically affects assets floating on the water surface, making for some really immersive moments. Now, before I get to our second use case of the day, a quick disclaimer. Obviously, all the things you're seeing here today we're still actively working on, but this one in particular, it's a bit early in the process. So, let's have a look at extreme oxygen density next. With the data saying we should have high rainfall and sunlight year-round, it's the perfect condition for our next biome to appear.
considering everything you've just seen is still very much work in progress, the Gameplay Capture team really did a great job showing our work in the best possible light. With Jungles, we wanted to explore the concept of vertical stratification, as they are the prime example for that. What it means is that you have horizontal layers of microbiomes defined by the, uh, defined by the species that thrives with the amount of sunlight and rain that still reaches there. The floor, herb and brush layer, we could almost do before, obviously missing the density. But now we also have the option to add variation to the tree layer by dynamically spawning epiphytes like lianas, orchids, or bromeliads attached to trunks and canopies of other acids. With this and improved density is what will finally allow us to make convincing jungles. And the best part is, we don't even need a lot of different species to create what we refer to as a canvas of a biome. The idea being that we can vary what kind of forest you're in by adding or replacing the plants that visually stand out the most. Now, to get us started on our certification, we made epiphytes like the epiprenum and the spromeliad, including a version for your hab, then obviously you need jungles for, uh, lianas for a jungle. And we also made the greas, which adds character to the herb and tree layer. For tall trees, we decided on a fairly generic rubber tree, as its different growth stages serve as a nice foundation for all height levels. And that's pretty much it, what we need to make a pretty good base for a jungle. Now, for our third and last use case, let's pretend the data indicates regular rainfall and moderate temperatures. This climate would support a lot of different forests, but we also wanted to use this opportunity to explore extreme scale. And it's just really cool. Now, for this one, we first looked at the different redwood biomes on Earth and tried to analyze what the most defining species of them are. With this understanding, we then decided on the following plants to allow for a fairly universal redwood forest that will allow us, that will easily support variation across continents and planets. A fairly common family of species for the ground levels of all redwoods are ferns, in our case, the salt fern. We also made a huckleberry variant to provide some visual density for the shrub layer. To add some Jurassic vibes, we made tree ferns, as they can be found in New Zealand's redwood forests. The most important one, though, are obviously sequoias, and they ended up being one of our most complex sets yet. As it turns out, they can grow to be fairly ridiculous in size. It keeps going. Now, one thing our game's foliage is sadly, sorely missing is the ability to properly react to what's happening around it. The goal here is to unify all forces from all sources, sorry for the horrible rhyme, um, all sources from all, all forces from all sources, wind, characters and creatures, ships, explosions and whatever else, and have the vegetation behave accordingly. Now, as part of our tech improvements, we will be implementing a GPU-based simulation that's fit for our game scale. For now, we've set up the ferns with our existing CPU-based one to better visualize what it will feel like to walk amongst those giants. 
Also, with the biomes on our planets now being defined by where an individual object wants to appear, you can expect a lot more happy accidents by having species invade different biomes, um, making for some unique locations, hopefully. Surely. Now, before I get to disappear off stage, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody involved, especially my team in Frankfurt for doing such amazing work and being all around great people. And also to all of you guys, I really hope you have a fantastic CitizenCon. This concludes this phase of Genesis, so please welcome Ian to the stage so I can tell you all about the next one. Thank you. Hello, Citizen Khan. All right. Those new planets and biomes were pretty, right? But it's time from phase three civilization to give you some stuff to do. So let's talk about location density. We've emulated nature as well as we can to make sure our planets are physically based and realistic and our biomes are emergent. But it's time to start populating the verse because where there's people, there are their lives and the structures they build. So it makes sense that whenever you go and explore these planets, that you find their lives. And what's even more important is that when we make these structures, that they use and they follow the same rules as our biomes, such as the jungles and the swamps. But before we continue, let's first take stock as to where we are now. At the moment in the verse, we have these custom, beautifully made locations, such as Ghost Hollow, we've got our distribution centers, or even just some outposts. And these have all been handcrafted by our designers and artists to hit that benchmark. And they've been working directly on the planet. However, going forward, this doesn't really scale with how we want to go forward with the game. Server meshing is about to arrive, and we're going to have a way higher player count. So those 73 bunkers across Stanton just won't cut it. But in general, it's also pretty barren. There's not much for you to explore and find stuff out there. So there's no exploration gameplay. You haven't really put your character to use for the way that you should. So this means we need to go bigger, which means we need to change our workflow. And with any workflow means we need to first establish a new benchmark. So with our new benchmark, we are ensuring quality and improve on our previous work and make it even better. And any location that you'll find needs to have its own unique personality and no repetition. We don't want you to find the same location twice. This also means that this is your exploration and your findings. So when you go out there and explore with your Carrick or with your Corsair, is that whatever you find, you can share with your orgs or with your friends. As for it, density, if you fly down to the planet, you, we want you to find something, let's say, every 100 clicks, but also improve the mission experience. So when you, you stay more on the planet, you're more immersed, and you go from location to location. Just keep going. So going forward, we are modularizing all our existing locations and assets, and we're basically making a library of buildings and layouts that we'll be using to no longer work directly on the planet. The neat thing, all these modules and assets can be iterated upon and tested right in the editor for all the designers and artists to ensure fun gameplay and interactive sandbox activity, and also make sure all the mission stuff is there. Basically, we're building a toolkit so let's look at some of the things that we need to keep in mind as we are making that toolkit. First and foremost, we've got our art style and branding. We've got things like Frontier for our settlements. We've got high tech for the emergency shelters, but also utilitarian like our bunkers and distribution centers. The richer the data, the richer these locations will be. Secondly, they all have a function. We've got mining for our mining outposts, farming for the farmsteads, or just places where people live. The function of the place will define the way the place looks as well, and its form. And last but not least, the people as well, the faction and their loadouts. We've got lawful people, like the new Citizens for Prosperity in Pyro, unlawful, such as Xenofred, and sometimes not even no, no one. And the place needs to look a bit, you know, 
derelict. In different places, you'll find different people. So, now that we've made our toolkit and we've defined all this new stuff, let's start building thousands of locations. Yes, I said thousands. So, to avoid the same issue of working on directly in the planet, I'd like to introduce to you Starkitect. <laughs> What Starkitect allows us to do is directly on a planetary scale scatter all these new libraries and modules and assets and no longer work directly on the planet. And it uses the same logical rule set as our emergent biomes. And we, it also gives us full control over the data that we set on these locations. So expect locations in places where they make sense. Let's kind of look at all these, this new Genesis data and all these new libraries and, and chuck it into Starkitect and see what it gives us. As you can see, we're now able to make full-size locations, and they will com look completely different based on where you'd find them. The layouts are control controlled by the rules, and it will reflect its place in the verse. We've got farms, mining outposts, but even our older locations, such as the bunkers that you find on Stanton. So, let's look at an example and kind of use the tool to really, you know, make a location. We can define the rules, as I've mentioned a couple times by now. So for our mining outpost, it wants to be near a resource. We can specify what this resource needs to be. But we can also give suggestions where sometimes you'd find it here and sometimes you wouldn't. If the location has refineries, it might want to be near water to refine the resources. Then secondly, we can define what buildings should be there. So obviously we need mining buildings houses for people to live as well, and even power buildings that we can leverage with the resource network. Starkitect will intelligently figure out where to place these and what needs to be at the location. Next up, farms. It's rules, well, temperature. Not every plant can live in every temperature, but the same with soil type. Only certain plants can be in certain grounds. And then we can query the seed map to determine what plants you would find there. What are the harvestables? As for the targets, again, farm buildings, obviously, power buildings, houses, but even animals, such as our beloved quasi-grazers. And last but not least, derelict ships. We've got these all over the place currently. Rules, well, they'd be close to anti-air because they would be shot down, but even in harsh flight conditions, such as mountains or low visibility, you probably most commonly find them. Targets, well, Crash ship parts, of course. Sometimes you'd find the full remains of a javelin, and the other time you might just find the nose of a starfare laying around. So, let's talk about coherency. Sure, we can scatter all these locations everywhere on the planet, and you'll find them in places they make sense, but we can do better. You don't just want to find an outpost completely on its own, right? We want to make sure it really feels like people have built their lives here. So, let's talk about some missing bits. We want to tell tighter stories, such as the people's lives, but also logical exploration. If I find one thing, I expect to find something similar or something else nearby. We also need more data control. What defines one mining outpost being different from the, el from the other ones, aside from the harvestables? And also give the narrative development. Make sure you know, people build near rivers, on mountains. They build near town halls. They build near distribution centers. So to hit that bit of our benchmark, we make sure that locations are near each other and group them together. The effect it gives is a fully developed landscape with vistas and points of interest all over. And we group them together in what we like to call a cluster like this one that has 13 locations. Let's talk about clusters. Clustering means generating locations near other locations. So, for example, if you find a distribution center, just like in the verse currently, I would find forward operating bases next to them. But if you go even further out, you'd find mining outposts to funnel those resources to the FOBs. Go out even further, 
you'd find caves around them, because that's where they might find some of the gems. And then we can even specify the data at, on a cluster level. The, all of the factions that live at this whole cluster, any mining outpost, that would be the same people, but also what commodities they sell, to find on what resource you'd find. So let's look at an example of the clusters. We have our mining cluster. Again, we can define what rules we should have. Rules, well, near a resource, just like our mining outpost, but also it needs to be on a lawful planet. We can target on a planetary scale where they would need to be. They need protection. As for the targets, well, caves, mining outposts, but even trade posts. Let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Before I do so, I forgot data. We can, on a cluster level, specify, again, what mineral commodities, but what also what harvestable types you'd find are in, the, in that region. Now let's look at the other side of the spectrum, an unlawful cluster. What rules? Well, they need to be far away from any other cluster, because they want to be isolated and do their evil deeds on their own. And also on an unlawful planet, such as somewhere in the Pyrus system. For the targets, outlaw outposts, crash ships, because they would shoot them down, and also ruins from just places that just completely overrun. The data on this one? You'd find specific loadouts, and they'll be using weapons that you wouldn't find in any other legal system. And these weapons will be sold at the shops in these regions. So, now that we have a cluster, let's go even bigger. Just like our locations, we can put clusters near other clusters, and we group them together ranging between 10 to 15 locations each. And we group this into what we call a sector. Like this one, that has about 120 locations. <laughs> However, on a planetary scale, we can define how many sectors we should have, with each their own data and persona. And every single one of these locations is now ready for the mission system to hook up and give you gameplay, and for you to find a bunch of places on your own. And just on this side of the planet, can you guess the number? We've got about 3,042 locations. And again, this means that Starchitect, we're just able to, on a planetary scale, just define how many locations we need, what you find there, and to just give that full identity. Thank you for listening. And I won't just see you in the verse, but I'll see you in a denser verse. <laughs> However, this was only the first phase of civilization. Let me introduce you to the stage, the person who will introduce life at these locations, Francesco Rucucci. So, uh, hi everybody. Benvenuti a CitizenCon. So, where are we today? So, my name is uh, Frances uh, Francesco Rucucci and I'm the director in CIG. Welcome to the next step of phase three. We will look into how life adapts to the laws of nature and how all the NPCs can interact pretty much with this incredibly vast and dense worlds that we just saw. So up to this point, we have seen how we are building the worlds. We start from the physical data set, and this is to make sure that what you see is not just beautiful and realistic, but also physically accurate. So the distribution of the elements that we have seen and the location and the POIs are influenced by geology, mission, narrative, and the lore. Those locations cannot be lifeless. We want the planets to basically leverage the space that emerge with life. So from an AI perspective, I will categorize the elements of those worlds into four macro groups. Emergent environment, that is everything we have just seen being built out of the physical data set. Users made locations. So this includes everything that our designers or you players will create in the world. So something that is mankind made and not predefined in the environment. 
interior of those locations. Now, this is very connected to the previous point. The difference is that they represent usually a confined space where there is much more tight interaction. And for NPCs, it's a lot about interaction with objects that we are usually used to in our everyday lives. And then the day and night cycle. So in essence, the passage of time that so far didn't have really a lot of impact on the gameplay. So to allow life to respect this world and conform to the rules that this environment defines, well, we want to improve our tools and work workflow, uh, and we want to distance ourselves as much as possible from a designer-driven approach. This is because, first, it's uh, labor-intensive. It can be prone to bugs, but also because the scale of the words that we've just seen are very hard to be you know, designer-driven in the markup. So we want to improve this workflow, and we will see how manual markup is also not usually the best option, because with these words that are heavily impacted by users and changes and customization, uh, it's very hard to know in advance where interesting things are. So today I want to show you a couple of examples of what the team has been focusing on uh, to make these systems uh, supported and scale correctly to support these vastly dense dynamic worlds. So we look at perception in light and dark environments and dynamic cover generation. So attacking an outpost now must have a level of depth that goes beyond what we had. So layouts of the environment can change, vehicles may or may not be present, and PC can be anywhere. And if it's a bright day, well, we will be more visible, but our enemies will also be more visible. And if you choose to attack at night time, well, we'll attack in shadows during darkness, it's going to be a bit harder to see our enemies, but we will also be harder to be spotted. And it will give us more opportunities to be stealthy and sneaky. How do we do that? So as you see, there is also a lot of different light conditions in this outpost. So in this scenario, we will start look at how perception is impacted by the day and night cycle. On the planetary surface, as we've seen in the outpost, natural and artificial lights are the two elements that will impact vision. And knowing that, you can use this to leverage your gameplay style to uh, exploit basically all the environment. So per what is perception? On the NPC level is the combination of data that we collect out of the senses. And vision is one of the senses and just tries to, um, in a way, simulates the human side ability. So designers can already tweak the perception in different ways. And one way is defining how quickly NPCs can understand what they are seeing. And the light condition have a direct impact how, how quickly an NPC will fully understand, for example, if there is an hostile in front of them. And obviously, there is condition of light that the designers can control, and some others, like the day and night cycle, that they can't. So in this video, we'll see two main elements, the graph on the top left and the two colorful cones. The graph on the left basically represents the current light level the NPC is in, and the current multiplier this light level generates to speed up or slow down the NPC perception and understanding. The two cones instead represent the primary and secondary FOV. The red color means that if you stand in that location, it will result in NPC reacting the slowest to you, and the green color instead represents the quickest response. So during the night, the NPC will have a hard time to understand and, and, and foresee and see things, but if they have flashlights on their helmets, they can turn it on, and this will impact their primary FOV, making still the peripheral vision a bit more uncertain. And as you see here, uh, First of all, the NPC is patrolling with his domesticated friendly copion. This is because he wants to exploit the vision, the night vision capabilities of the animal, and it's kind of our tier zero pets. So we will now look at the cover system. That is the next dynamic things that I want to show you. Uh, so when we introduced planetary navigation mesh the first time, our goal was really to create a system that would support and process the environment in a very dynamic way. Uh, our planets are just way too big to statically export them and process them, first of all. And then they also, their regions only exist when somebody's there and the NPCs are there. So essentially, environment has its purpose only when life exists. 
Also, let's keep in mind that even if we could explore dynamically and statically those planets, so processing dynamically all the static version of the planet, this would be, first of all, wasteful and on the memory side and time consuming. Uh, and also because we have a lot of runtime modification of the rain, this would require us to still reparse the runtime. And pretty much that will be almost all the time. So to generate the cover data, we want to leverage the navigation mesh system. And what we do is, as you see here, the blue uh, polygons are basically where NPCs can walk. And the green ones are what we call cover surfaces, that are our represent, simple representation of the environment, what the NPC uses to, the, to understand if they can hide behind something and if they can shoot from some positions. So up to now, we have had an approach where a designer would, uh, would be a designer-driven approach. The designer can define in the locations where cover was interesting. They could mark it up either the location itself or prefabs, and then with a special entity that would just sample dynamically the environment, but would still be designer driven. Um, this is obviously a good approach for, it's also a standard approach in gaming industry, but what about all those organic and inorganic elements that get scattered with a new system? Like if designers want to iterate on these ones, for example, and they want to change the physical data sets, those scattering tool will just change completely the layout. And what we want is that designers can do this change without being afraid of doing it because the gameplay was you know, predefined and controlled. And now they can just make something beautiful but also fun. Besides that, yes, we did have a prefab approach where you can build stuff out of small building blocks. This is obviously a good approach because it's, uh, uh, you know, in a way, you can build stuff out of smaller version, but this creates a lot of unnecessary data. Imagine a crate, and we can say that the crate can generate cover. Now we stack 100 crates, and what happens? That we have a lot of data to generate cover that we have to process, throw away. This would just waste CPU cycles for nothing. This is why, until now, you also couldn't find an NPC in a forest like this one and see them hiding behind a, co a tree or a rock. So enabling the dynamic generation of covers on the planet allows us to exploit all the elements of the environment. Whenever navigation mesh generates, NPC can now have a chance to fight with you hiding behind available elements. Boulders, rock, walls, and all useful, are all useful elements right now. However, we don't have to limit ourselves to static geometries, but also vehicles can be used for cover. And as you can see, this is dynamically generating while the vehicle moves. So be careful where you park your URSA, because now it can become a source of danger for you as well. Last but not least, these systems can be just used on all the different type of navigation mesh we have, so not on the planet, but also, for example, the interiors and everything you guys construct. Because obviously, you guys will build your own locations, but you don't really mark up stuff, or you don't want to decide that, because that's going to come automatically out of the system. So I want to show you. So what I want to show you now is just like a little bit of insight of what goes behind the scene when we generate cover and navigation mesh. These are some of the steps that our system does. So we always start from the environment voxelization. What that means is we process the geometry, the physical representation of the geometries that is a little bit simpler than usually the render mesh, and we construct it in a voxelized approach. This is also using different types of agent definition. Why so? Because obviously where a human can move is not the same as where a vehicle can move. So we can define different type of precisions and then speeding up the process where we, where we have to and be more precise where we cannot be to. And we can also create overrides based on different things. For example, if you crouch, you can enter into smaller locations that where you stand. Um, this process is basically common between navigation mesh and cover. After that is generated, then we can evaluate the voxel in different ways, for example, defining where we can walk. So can we make the step with our foot over a specific voxel? Or is there something in front of that hole in the NAM mesh so that we can actually cover behind? And then we can basically decide where to generate cover surfaces. And after the cover surfaces are generated, we can process where the cover locations are. Cover locations are a good spot for MPC to be behind the cover. So what we see here is that with the introduction of Maelstrom last year, obviously we knew this would revolutionize how you guys are playing. And we did have to find a solution to handle all the destruction you can feel. So you were destroying so much stuff in this world that we had to find a solution, right? So this is why we approach the coverage generation navigation mesh as it is, 
because there is just no way for us to predict anything that you are doing, and we want just Maelstrom to be another trigger or word evaluation. So as you see, this is all dynamically generating. And destroying anything just makes the war be re -evaluated. So, as you see here, we can have also lots of rules. So you, you, can, you can see that a bit here. But when things break, first they invalidate. And then when they rest, for example, we can decide when is a good moment to regenerate so that we also don't waste too much CPU cycles. Uh, the color that you see is mostly uh, cover quality. So you see the light green is high cover, the dark green is low cover, and then we have the red that we introduced some time ago that is basically not really good cover, but if there is nothing better, well, it's better to be behind something than being you know, in open space. So let's just recap. What we want to do is finding a plan and having a good plan to approach life in this vast universe. What we want is the life to be able to systemically evaluate all the dynamic environments that is generated. We want to improve our workflow, not only to support designers and being faster, but also support all your guys' creations. So we want the life to adapt, and this is all for making the game fun for you, so that everything comes together. So thank you all. This was phase three. And now, let's welcome Ben Parry that will introduce you guys to phase four of Genesis. Thank you. Hello, CitizenCon. <laughs> What's going on? Sorry, someone's changed my lines. <laughs> Welcome to phase four, light and sound. Now, we've seen already um, automated systems for automatically placing different biomes, uh, different uh, vegetation, settlements, and people. So now we're going to take the same approach to automatically handling light itself. First of all, why is this important? Well, it's not always obvious, especially when they do their jobs as well as they do. But there's an incredible amount of attention from the lighting artists that goes into all of the locations that we have in the game. Besides just marking up the reflection probe areas, they also manage the visuals really carefully, adding fill lights, um, approximating bounce lights off ground and up into ceilings and dark corners where there aren't any direct lights pointing, really. Um, and the problem is, not only does this take a lot of time and really constrain the style that they're using, it's simply not possible. If you've got a planet full of forests and, what was it, 3,000 and something placed locations, you're going to be exploring places that no artist has ever visited. No, they've not looked at and they're certainly not going to be able to have tweaked it for you. So we need something that works completely hands off. And natural outdoor scenes are especially problematic for us. Indoors, you can put a lot of little lights around, pointing from different directions, and you can probably justify it. Outdoors, you've got the sun, and you've got the sky. And if you're behind a tree, you've got the sky. And so you need that skylight to vary. Now, So this is the forest as you'd see it without the GI system. As you can see, all the shadows are receiving lighting from the same environment probe, so it's basically just a flat color across. We replace that with around 40,000 mini ray trace probes. Each of them has their own view of the sky, and so that gives you way more contrast and variation as you move in and out of the canopy. Now, there are a couple of other pieces of the puzzle that we've been working over on over the last year. Now, the first is, well, all the stuff that you can't stick 40,000 mini probes onto. Anything that doesn't have an opaque surface, we can't really know where it is on the screen and track it from frame to frame. But if we don't do anything, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb. We've got fog, we've got particles, we've got the other little things. I don't know what they are. Um, and so we need something to do with those. So to address this, we've added a kind of stable grid of medium-y kind of probes that are generated around the player as you move around. So that gives us approximately, like, uh, there, approximately matching lighting that we can apply to all of those things. Now, this is a little bit difficult to illustrate in normal scenes. So uh, for once, I've been making my own levels. As you can see, Pico's in trouble again. Um, but because the lighting team hasn't helped, you can't see anything in most of the scene. 
If you add the transparency GI system, suddenly the whole scene comes alive. And this is something that we could never have done um, until we added this tech. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is glossy reflections. Now, we've got a fair few shiny objects in the game, you may have noticed. And we've got the same problem that if we fix the lighting on one thing and then the reflections don't match, it's going to look terrible. Also, ray tracing reflections is really cool, and we wanted to do it. Um, and the challenge here, though, is that the ray trace reflections you're going to do, they're not just mirrors. Like, we've got a whole range of objects in the game from like a scuffed hull panel all the way up to chrome polished pipes, and we want the same system to apply globally across that. So I'm going to do an uncomfortably short breakdown on what this tech looks like and how that comes together. So here's what, oh, sorry, here's what we need to be. Now, obviously, it reads as shiny, but there's this kind of fakeness to it. Um, it kind of looks a bit like it's flying. So, so let's see what the ray tracing looks like. Yeah, it's really noisy and horrible. We need to clean it up. So what we do is we let pixels share their data in space, and then also in time to clear up the final image. And then we let the game's normal anti-aliasing just kind of clean up the last stuff and carry us over the finish line. And that's how you make a chrome penguin. Now, I'm going to derail for a moment away from the topic of Genesis, because this isn't actually just about automating the lighting for new environments. This is also about pushing quality in areas that have already had all of that work done by the lighting team. We're freeing the artists up to light more naturally, allowing the time of day shifts to be embraced rather than fighting against them. And as I'm about to show, players and NPCs are going to reap the same benefits as well. So here we start adding natural areas of light and shade and warm and cool colors. These open areas benefit in the same way as the forest scene did, adding areas of shade and areas of open lighting. Like I mentioned, the time of day shifting leads to different ambience as the sun moves. And this is the shot that I just liked. Finally, let's see how the new GI system can brighten up your character's day. <laughs> and also their day as well, whoever they are. Well, uh, I promised you light and sound, but I don't actually know anything about sound. So here's the man who does, Graham Phillipson. Good afternoon, CitizenCon. I've been at CIGE nearly 10 years, and this is the first time I've done this. Very exciting for me. So, uh, do you want to make some noise? So, um, sound isn't as fast as light, so it takes me a bit to catch up. Jared wrote that joke for me, so you can blame him. Says it right here, blame him. So now we have a huge amount of visual and interactable content. Locations, biomes, populations, planets, and systems. And now they're all beautifully lit too, thanks Ben. But how do we paint this world with sounds? It's a challenge, it's a challenge of scale, we need to support multiple star systems, and it's a challenge of quality. We want the highest quality possible. We also don't want implementation to hinder creativity, and we want a seamless experience. So we're asking a lot. But with Star Audio, we can rapidly implement audio for entity classes, brushes, or audio sweeteners, all of which can be reused and reflected immediately across the game, including all of those emergent locations we talked about earlier. So again, this is Genesis data driving what happens in game. And we can do all this without breaking flow. So here's a fairly dry video. It gets more exciting later, I promise. Uh, showing you our rapid workflow. 
So over on the left, uh, to think about that, we have the uh, WISE editor, that's where all our sounds live. In the middle, we have Star Audio editor, and on your right, we have uh, an entity that needs some insect sounds on it. So we can very quickly drag from WISE to Star Audio, we can mark up very quickly a bit of logic, and we can re-trigger this entity's spawn sound so that it immediately makes a sound. I assure you that is a group of insects. Um, Thank you, you're, you're too kind. If you like that one, you'll like the ones that come later. But there's a little something missing. So to add some realism, sounds respond to how, they move, or how you move in the world and how they move relative to you. So we need to change the frequency as their velocity relative to the listener changes. This is known as the Doppler effect. In simple terms, the pitch dropping as something whizzes by. Or in even simpler terms, <laughs> now, sound designers traditionally needed to implement their own Doppler sounds. But given how fast we can travel through these rich, dense locations, and the sheer number of them, we can't afford to be doing that any longer. So we've created a systemic Doppler solution. And I'm going to show you that now, the only way I know how. By putting a big Benny Noodle machine on top of a mountain. <laughs> So you can hear the pitch and tempo changing as we move relative to the Benny Noodle machine, and this is all fully systemic, no special treatment for this sound. And I expect the Noodle Bar to be very busy after that commercial. So, how does it work? Well, the listener is surrounded by variable time delay buffering, not the horrible kind of buffering you get on the internet. This is a really nice kind that helps the uh, gain sound good. Uh, each buffer represents a section of the sphere around the audio listener, and um, the audio is mixed into these buffers at a position that, that is uh, appropriate to the object's position in the world. Changes in the position are applied to the delay buffer by interpolating the audio data. But that's not all we're doing here. Now, I know there was a bar citizen yesterday, so some of you may not be thinking as fast as you might normally, but you may have realized that by buffering the data in this way, we're not just creating a uh, speed of sound. We are not just creating a Doppler effect. We are indeed, and I just spoiled my own line, creating a speed of sound effect. So, introducing systemic speed of sound to the game, I now have uh, a couple of minutes of video, and we go through rapid fire, looking at some fantastic examples of what this brings to the game, starting with a spaceship pass by that is supported tonally by the uh, systemic speed of sound. OK, sounds cool. What about weapon fire? So let's bring in a sniper and, unfortunately for the uh, sensitive of heart, a Pico. Um, we're going to hear this first from the perspective of both with no speed of sound effect. OK, so that's, if you are at the Pico perspective there, that's how you'd hear it in game right now. Let's hear it with speed of sound enabled, and this time we're just going to listen from Pico's perspective. So Pico's down before he even hears the shot. But don't worry, he's not dead. OK, let's finish him off. Now he's dead. And uh, as the voice of Pips power up, uh, I need to get some props placed with him. So there's one more example for you. Now finally, oh, not finally, we have ship weapons, so listen to the fire ray as the ship approaches the camera here, giving you a bit, bit of a sense of threat. It's not too easy to tell what's going on there, but you get an increase in fire ray. 
Finally, the really cool stuff, explosions. So we can put a cinematic element, a uh, shockwave element, and a delayed speed of sound effect. And that's way too cool to do just once, so we're going to do it twice more from further distance. So again, cinematic effect first when you see it. Shockwave. And the explosion itself. This is all completely driven by parameters in the game, so we can do this for real whenever you drop a Moab. One more. That's pretty cool. So the speed of sound simulation gives you a better sense of distance, it improves the sense of speed, and it supports those amazing uh, cinematic moments. So in summary, we're trying to make the game more immersive and respond to all this Genesis data and make it feel more real. And that's not all we can do. We can make sounds respond differently to changes in atmospheric pressure and resultant changes in temperature. So, for example, the sound will travel faster in extremely hot, high-pressure environments. We really look forward to getting this in-game for you and getting you enjoying it at home. Now, that's all from uh, phase four of the Genesis cycle, light and sound. So I'm going to hand you back to the amazing Ben and Ali to bring us home with the final phase. Thank you, sir. So, as Graham says, this is going to be the final phase of Genesis, and it's called Nature's Wrath. And, and this is where we're going to bring the very planet itself to life. So, first off, let's start talking clouds. So, clouds have got an atmosphere, have got to be one of my favorite visual features of our game, and they're truly awesome, but they're also completely static. Nothing has changed with them. So, what we want to bring with Genesis is the evolution of clouds over time. But this isn't just some simple scrolling animation. We use the same physical data sets that drove the biomes we talked about earlier and Star Architect. And these are also now driving a physical simulation of the clouds so they can form and dissipate in realistic conditions. So this means things like the oceans, the prevailing winds, mountain ranges, and the temperature will all impact the clouds. But to complement these more dynamic clouds, we've also improved our lighting model. So it now quickly accounts for how light scatters multiple times inside a cloud. And this is important, creates much deeper lighting, and it can contrast against the sun's rays, resulting in much more vivid cloudscapes like we see on the left here, something we're all too familiar with in Manchester. Now, it would be awesome to bring this into context and show it on an actual location. Let's take a look at a quick scene to round this up. It's a nice day on the surface, but something's different. The clouds are moving, but they're not just moving. They're forming naturally in changing shape. They dissipate as they glide on the atmosphere based on wind data, stratus and cumulus alike. Now we start seeing the new cloud shading model come into play. We are seeing enhanced occlusion beneath the cover emphasizing the sunbeams, how it interact with the clouds, and seeing the light shafts peer through the layers. Now, as this is closing in, we can start to see the changes in visibility of the area. Light precipitation is starting. Previously, we authored static cloud shapes, but no longer. We didn't manually place a volume here. Its presence has been informed by Genesis data. Oh, and it's not just a cloud volume. It's a weather front. Now we're trying to see the wind picking up. Terrain and rocks are getting wet. Vegetation, grass, and the overall environment are responding to the weather. The system is changing the world around us. We can see puddles being formed dynamically in the dirt, properly responding to light, reflections, and rain droplets. 
making it getting, it's getting really ominous and loud in here. I can feel the danger. I think we should let this play out in the game. we call the Falco maneuver to get out of there. Ali, please break this down for us. What did we just see? Yeah, so that was a combination of lots of tech we just saw. They're all combined together to make a really great cohesive experience. So we started with the cloud simulation, which wasn't really a cloud simulation. It's a weather simulation. The rain will appear not at random, but it's based on physically plausible conditions. So you have real weather fronts evolving across your planet all the time. We have a host of visual effects, like the rain, and then they have the atmospheric scattering that you get under the columns of rain. We had the puddles and the splashes and the, all of this type of visual effects. We saw the wind developing over time, and that introduced turbulence to the flight model, making flight very challenging. And then, of course, we saw the lightning, which plays havoc with your instrumentation, but a direct strikes will damage your ship, and, of course, direct, uh, some storms will be dangerous enough to be fatal, as Ben's unlucky Aurora just found out. And these storms will sometimes be short-lived, 
and localized, but others will be larger and potentially permanent on some planets. And this is going to restrict access via flight. I mean, players will be forced to resort to ground vehicles or even foot. And this is all going to be dynamic, meaning that you might find yourself trapped in some really unexpected situations. So we really can't wait to use all these mechanics to open up many new gameplay opportunities for all in the verse soon. A wise yogi once said, it's your job as a pilot to compensate and stay on course. Mm -hmm. All right, what have we learned today, guys? We've shown you an approach to, of encoding the rules of nature into planetary data. We've seen biomes emerge from geology, temperature, humidity, climate, weather, the physical terrain. We create denser, more diverse living planets without artists hand-placing or manu manually creating biomes, instead leveraging asset mapping. We've shown you a new way to make the game that can scale to create thousands of Korean plant places for civilizations on planets that can be used for missions or immersion gameplay without art and design hand-placing locations, leveraging world design rules instead. We've seen how populations of AI and NPCs inhabiting locations dynamically adapt their understanding of the environment without custom markup by developers, allowing the creation of more playable spaces rapidly. We've shown you how light and sound also benefit from Genesis data to influence planetary environments, and we've shown how these, system, these systems come together when weather comes into an area, changing your gameplay experience significantly. Our goal with Genesis and all of its systems is to create more worlds, better worlds, faster, by applying our tech wizardry and craftsmanship to build systems that respond to data. That's our Star Engine presentation for today, guys, for this year. Have a great CitizenCon. We'll see you next month.